I'd like to call the meeting of the Urbana City Council to order. I see Heather Stevenson approaching. We'll just wait till she gets in. Okay, we got Heather here. Heather, I've called the meeting to order. And I'd like to start with uh, all those who are able to stand for a moment of silence in view of the events in Boston. Thank you. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bauer Sox Johnson. Present. Mr. Jacobson. Mr. Lewis. Here. Ms. Marlin. Here. Mr. Roberts. Here. Mr. Smythe. Here. Ms. Stevenson. Mayor Pressing. Here. The first item is approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. That is April 1st, 2013. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Robert Lewis. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Are there additions to the agenda? I don't see oh, any additions. Yeah. Oh, Charlie? Uh, uh, given that we have one person attending electronically, and in case she gets bumped off, uh, she requested that we take a vote on the item necessary for her vote uh, early on. Yes, we can do that. So you want to move um, item number um, H? F, F1H. to the top of the yeah. reports of standing committees. We can do that. Is there any objection? Okay, that's the liquor license and Diane is our fourth um, alderman who, in, who could uh, vote on it. Okay, we will move to petitions and communications. Jeff Yaki, do I have your name correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Is Jeff Yaki here? Well, um, Michael Kilcullen. You Hello. have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Michael Kilcullen, 202 North Ray Street, Urbana, Illinois. And I am speaking about the Kent Street issue again. And uh, I wanted to uh, mainly, I, I did go out and do some individual survey voluntarily on my own without being hired by either the city or by the residents. And I wanted to take a little bit of time just to make some notes about some of my uh, observations and comments. I was out there yesterday during the evening around 6 p.m., which was still daylight, as you can see in this first picture, and there's some cars parked, or a, a car parked, there's some cars driving um, right away here at Kinshaw, Washington, so on the north side of the area. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of going through these fast because there are a lot. And all these pictures are available. I will they, they will be submitted to the city for good. So, uh, But uh, we see just only about two or three vehicles are parked in the entire stretch during the day. Um, there are some people walking on the sidewalk as well, so some people are out. We do see the area where the road is wide and it's narrowing down to that southern half, or southern, very southern portion. And... 
the thing I will notice, okay, we have, there's a small issue here of the driveway that's maybe incomplete. Most of the driveways have been filled in a bit. Um, more. So what I'm really seeing during the day is that almost most houses uh, have driveway, uh, every house had driveways and garages. Most of them were double spaced, double cars. There's a few, this is a duplex and it had a single lane drive and a single garage on each side. S but uh, here's some of the side streets. And so just looking at that, th this is neither yay or nay, but this is just information. And we see this on a Sunday. Most of the traffic reports or studies that probably were done by the city or public works might have been during weekdays. We were told that people are at work during the day. So I came out on a Sunday when we expect people to be home or about or having dinners with families. So this is just a sampling. Um, I believe this is the corner where we have trouble while, where people are vereening around into mailboxes, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a separate issue uh, about uh, the stop sign study, perhaps. Okay. Now, I did go back out there later. Oh, I will say there were two people on bicycles during the day. They were both adult men, and they were both on a sidewalk, actually. Uh, other people were walking around. There were kids playing in some front yards on one of the side streets. It's, you know, so people were out during the day. Yeah. Now, I went back out at 1 a.m. during the night last night and this morning. It is dark out there. It is very dark out there. Um, s a few of these pictures are taken with flash. Some of them are not, and I don't have a good night camera. This is actually at the corner of Washington and Vine where we see a Sharrow's bike marking, and this is the Washington Street where the bike lane starts where you guys had already previously prohibited the parking. Um, so on the way, you know, on the way down to Washington and Kinch here. So this is a on Kinch. That same car that was parked during the day is still here. This is the only car on the entire stretch that's still that was parked overnight. And this is in the white section because the church is on the left side and the house is on the right. At um, so this is now looking down the street without the flash. With flash, so you can see just how dark it really is down there. Um, trying to get signs, and even that was hard. <laughs> um, what I saw, at even at 1.22 a.m. northbound, a guy was riding a bicycle. I was so shocked. <laughs> there were, when I was on my way southbound, there was two, a guy and a lady talking on one of the side streets. That it was qu a normal conversation, not yelling, no, you know, no fight. I could never did see them. It was so dark, so I don't know if they were on a sidewalk or on a porch or on property. But people were just casually talking outside. It didn't, s you know. Um, you have so one minute, Mr. Kilcullen. Thank you. Okay, so I saw the bicycle coming northbound. I got to the end of the street, and then I was uh, when I was riding back northbound on Kinch. Then a guy was walking down the sidewalk about 1:30 a.m. with a styro full of food, and he was eating his food walking down the sidewalk. And then three other people were on a side street at that, you know, a little bit later. And then I got back up to the end. So. Um, I'm just saying to take some of this at its worth of, you will see as we get down. Every, this is the southern half, and you will see like every, gr uh, every driveway, I, I took a picture of each house on the southern end, and every driveway had empty spots uh, where extra cars could either park inside, or uh, on the drive, I mean. Don't know inside or outside the garage, but there was no cars on the street, and there was no cars even in driveways. So these are just pictures. You can make your own opinions. I'm not going to state much about that. Okay. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Yaki. Hello, Jeff Yaki. I'm at 304 West Washington Street. I'm also the uh, president of the Champaign County Bikes, an education and advocacy group. And a number of our members um, were always interested in these things uh, around the town. And uh, a number of our folks uh, took a look at it. And I think you heard from a couple of them last week. Um, I just submitted a letter. I'll just quickly uh, read it, I guess, into the record here. Um, Thanks for carefully looking at this opportunity to add bike infrastructure on Kinch Street as part of the Safe Routes to School project 
and thanks for being mindful of the concerns of the residents on King Street. I support the bike infrastructure as, as planned. Retrofitting existing streets to bike infra infrastructure does bring some changes to current residents. After reviewing the plans and listening to the discussions concerning these improvements on Kinch, I understand the changes to be reasonable and on the whole very minimal. One change we can't see today or tomorrow, but we can expect to see in the future, is more and more kids and neighborhood residents riding to school and other destinations on Kinch Street. This is change for the good, for personal health and economics and the environment. I think that's something to keep in mind. As we're working in our community to add more bike lanes, we're connecting sections that are, are well equipped with sections that you know with future improvements and all that connectivity makes it easier for more and more people to think about going where they need to go from where they live to school to work to errands that kind <coughs> of stuff and so uh, we are approaching some critical mass and I think that's a very good thing and this is uh, a, a part of that safe routes to school plan which connects residents to the primary schools and also the older kids down to the middle school and uh, high school and so um, you won't see that overnight, but as we do more and more of these improvements, we will see more bikes on streets. Um, just one other thought here. Uh, along with the discussion of this bike plan, I heard concerns about neighborhood safety, particularly the speed of traffic on Kinch and the absence of streetlights. These are real concerns, and I encourage the council to look for means to address both of these issues. Slower traffic and a well-lit street creates a very favorable environment for pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as the neighborhood as a whole even for the neighbor out in his or her yard late in the evening with their dog. Be glad for any questions. Thanks for letting me uh, address this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, we have <coughs> two people who want to just register that they're here. Uh, Reverend Dr. Evelyn B. Underwood um, is here for concerns over the sewer resolution and Bishop King James Underwood um, is here representing the Dr. Ellis subdivision, and he too is has concern for the resolution of the sewer problem. Okay, Christina Beatty. Christina Beatty, 1304 Kinch. Uh, northeast corner of Kinch in Michigan. I uh, spoke a couple weeks ago, uh, learned a lot at that meeting, and just wanted to briefly follow up. Uh, now that the weather's nicer, I've been taking a lot more walks with my son and thinking about this a lot, and I'm definitely growing uh, in favor of it. I appreciate all the work the city council has done. I think there's a lot of research. I read the memo from, was it Gabe Lewis on April 4th, and that really spelled out and answered a lot of questions. Um, and so I also want to say that the communication from you has been good as well. At one point it was mentioned that maybe the neighborhood didn't know about it, but I remember getting all, I want to say, three letters, at least two. Um, so I just want to clarify that. Uh, and then even just the thought of that bike, bike lanes might even slow traffic down a little bit, that would be helpful. So just want to reemphasize the street lights and the possible stop sign. And other than that, thank you. Thank you. Rick Langwa. I don't need to see you guys. Uh, he is in favor of the city plan. Okay, thank you all. Uh, we have a special presentation from the Champaign County Economic Development Corporation. Oh. Would you like to introduce our guests? Uh, good evening. Um, the uh, Champaign County Economic Development Corporation has offered the opportunity to all the participating municipalities uh, for them to do a presentation before uh, boards, commissions, councils. Uh, and uh, in speaking with uh, Councilwoman <laughs> Diane Marlin, who is the council rep on the EDC, uh, we thought that that was a good idea for uh, these folks to come and present to you. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Kirchhoff and Eric Kateva from the Champaign County Economic Development Corporation and Greg Gonda with the Small Business Development Center, which is a partner organization of the EDC. So I'll turn it over to Mike. <laughs> thank you, Tom. M Mayor Pressing, members of the council, thank you for having us this evening. Our thoughts are with uh, Council Member Marlin as she recovers this evening. Uh, so we, we miss her presence, but uh, she may be listening in. We'll see. <laughs> Good evening, Diane. Um, 
With that being said, uh, Eric and Greg and I are here this evening to brief you on, uh, to provide you a brief update on some of our activities. And to that end, I think Eric has distributed to you uh, a number of documents. Uh, chief, uh, first among those things is a bookmark, uh, which is a, a listing of all of the staff of the EDC. So we're as close as you, uh, as your keyboard of your computer, uh, or your iPad. And so don't ever hesitate to contact us with questions or concerns you might have or suggestions. Um, so I wanted to be sure you had that. I, th I find that particularly convenient as opposed to having a, a stack of business cards from all of us. That way, it's all in one spot for you. We're going to go through this in, uh, in some reasonable order this evening. I'm going to speak to you about the organizational fact sheet that's in front of you and a little bit on then the performance report. Eric's going to take over after that. We've asked Greg this evening to talk with you about some of the results of our Small Business Development Center and some of the clients that they've been working with uh, in terms of uh, demographics and things of that nature. So with regards to this organizational fact sheet, and it's the one that's got pictures along the left-hand side, just very briefly. The Champaign County Economic Development Corporation, as you know, is the uh, organization that's most interested in top line revenue growth for our communities in the county. The bottom line is, is that either by keeping businesses here or by bringing new businesses here, our objective is, for, from your perspective, is to help retain revenue and grow revenue for uh, the municipalities and the county. To accomplish that, we undertake these priority actions that are listed in the second section, business retention and expansion, including visits on local companies to help them address issues that they may be dealing with or capitalize on opportunities that they may have, business attraction efforts, relationship building with our stakeholders, marketing of the county in general, uh, and Mayor Pressing, as you know, work uh, on Willard Airport development. Thank you for your assistance with that. Educational opportunity, utility, and public service engagement. We have a 36-member uh, board of directors. We've listed for you there in the center of the page the officers uh, the current year. Our fiscal year ends at the end of June, and so those are our officers through the end of uh, our fiscal year. Laura Ferrix is our chair, Jill Guth, vice chair, Chris Troyer is our treasurer, and Gary Burgett is our immediate past chair. And you can see listed there are executive committee members, which include, uh, which include Tom. Uh, and Tom's leadership is absolutely exceptional for the EDC. And we appreciate uh, your uh, uh, contribution of Tom's leadership to us because it is critically important to our organization. Uh, we have a staff of seven folks that operate essentially in two business units, the Small Business Development Center and then general EDC operations. And those are somewhat interwoven in terms of disciplinary functions within the office um, because so many times the companies that Eric works with from a, from a business retention perspective may also qualify from a small business perspective. So often we find ourselves sharing clients with one another. And then obviously we work with the city of Urbana on a number of economic development issues, not the least of which, as I mentioned earlier, Mayor, was the, is the effort we're working on together currently with regards to Willard Airport. I'll switch now to the performance report, which is the second document with the uh, results at a glance along the right-hand side. My role on this one is to talk you through the last section and the first section uh, with regards to the bottom of the page, budgeting and staffing. Just to give you an idea of uh, the scope of the organization from a financial perspective, our non-grant funded budgeted revenue is about $466,000 rounded. Our total uh, revenue is around $637,000, and that includes grant funding. Uh, that is the SBDC. That's the differential between our core funding and our SBDC grant funding. 81% of, uh, of our costs are fixed costs from the perspective of salaries, benefits, and facilities and then 19% in variable costs. As I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, we have seven people on staff. Two are fully de dedicated to the SBDC, but portions of the rest of our time also are allocated to the SBDC. So functionally, it's more than two people. In terms of uh, the uh, objective being top line revenue growth, which is addressed in that bottom box in the right-hand corner, um, that our objective is top line revenue growth, I want to talk about this example that's included at the top of the page. The impact of, of business retention in particular on a community is, is important. It's something that doesn't often make headlines per se. Sometimes it does, but often it doesn't. What tends to make headlines is when you bring a big company in and it's a bunch of, you know, a couple hundred new jobs or something of that nature, that makes headlines. And one of the reasons it makes headlines is that any new project, let's say a hundred new jobs are created in the community, 
each project has a multiplier associated with it, which involves the, the, the amount of times that the money associated with that project, whether it's payroll or whether it's construction, the amount of times that money cycles through the economy results in additional grocery store sales or car sales or home sales, et cetera, throughout the community. And as those things build on themselves, grocery stores have to put on another staff person. The uh, car dealership has to hire another salesperson, et cetera. That's the, that's the idea behind the multiplier impact. As it happens with business retention, though, um, if we lose a company, we also have a negative multiplier, and I think people often don't think about that. That's one of the reasons that calling on these companies and addressing their needs is so important. With, uh, with regards to this example, Eric put together an example for us, a business with 300 employees, a $13 million payroll, and a 190,000 square foot facility. So using that multiplier impact, that creates another 170 jobs elsewhere in the economy. And uh, it's a $6.4 million payroll impact elsewhere in the economy. From a revenue perspective, the direct property tax benefit $6,800, but multiplier impact $252,000. So it does ultimately affect, as you all know, because I know you've, you've worked with this for a long time, it ultimately affects the bottom line of the community, uh, in, a, in the community's checkbook, if you will. And so that's our objective from the perspective of working with you all as our clients, is to help you keep that revenue in your checkbook and to grow more in the community's, in the community's general fund. So with that, let me turn it over to Eric to talk about some of our uh, business development activities. Good evening. I am uh, Deputy Director of the Economic Development Corporation, and uh, I'm primarily responsible for our business interactions uh, throughout the community. And we, they take various forms uh, in, in the different initiatives we have. So if you take a look at the right-hand side, we have these broken down by kind of our type of business interaction activity. And the first one is really our most intense interaction, and that's a face-to-face -face business retention visit. And uh, we've got 38 to date. Um, a few more. Uh, we put this together you know, a couple weeks back. But um, we take city staff with us. Um, it, or, or county staff, if it's uh, you know pertinent to that um, employer, and we make sure that all of the businesses' uh, needs are being met when it comes to their uh, presence in the community. If it's a uh, workforce, if it's um, a supplier they may need, if they have some kind of uh, a connection with a specialized service, we can help them out with. And sometimes it comes down to um, what we call a technical service project and um, a technical assistance, you know, where they might need a pothole fixed or they may not might need a sidewalk for their employees to go to lunch, um, as in one case we've been working on, lo on uh, recently. Um, and so uh, additionally in these meetings, we also collect information um, through various levels of questioning that kind of help us understand the company's um, level of risk in the community. Are they here to stay or are they facing pressures that might push them elsewhere? And so we can uh, focus our efforts and resources on those companies that might have the greatest value and that might be at the most risk. Um, if you take a look at, look at the other numbers there, 180 additional unique business contacts. These are uh, phone calls we make throughout the day for uh, whatever reason, whether it's uh, follow-up from a phone call um, or you know, sometimes we uh, do referrals to the Small Business Development Center um, um, and a number of other things. The uh, 3,850 number is the number of jobs impacted through our various visits, uh, specifically the retention visits. And the uh, industry roundtables is next, and this is uh, a, a newer initiative for us in that we're taking a uh, business network approach where uh, we try to bring companies together and really develop relationships with them and between them to help encourage them to you know, find ways that they can collaborate for, you know, um, to help them achieve a cost savings or maybe um, find, you know, some like interest where um, they may need uh, a piece of machinery to achieve uh, supplying a, a new customer. Uh, things like that that will help create more jobs, help create more investment. And we've got uh, various ones of these going on. The most recent one in the past was a biotech roundtable that we held at Carl, and we've got companies from uh, both Urbana and Champaign uh, coming to to talk about some of the R and D efforts in biotech and some of the uh, the companies uh, that are growing um, out of the university that uh, you know might land in, in Urbana. Um, 
we have a distribution, manufacturing, and, and a uh, commercial brokers uh, roundtable coming up as well, where we'll meet with companies and, and try to do these similar things. Looking at um, other initiatives that we're focusing on, we've, we work with uh, a group called UCAN, and really UCAN is an outgrowth from the, from the EDC. It's the Urbana Champagne Angel Network. And this is a group of angels that hears from about six companies uh, on a regular basis to you know, understand what they do, hear their pitch, and potentially form um, an LLC and make an investment in a company. And as you can see here, we've had uh, 22 companies present uh, and about nine deals done by um, angels uh, over the past, uh, what is that, two years, two or three years. So really that's, that's great and there's a number of other companies that because of their practice going through UCAN, they've received additional funding from a venture capitalist or otherwise. Um, so uh, great uh, success there and really the, the critical nature of this in our community is that we saw there was a shortage of funding sources for these type of startup companies in the, in the equity area. Um, and so this really fills that spot and I think and it has grown um, to be quite an, an organization. Mike did touch on the airport some. Um, I'll, I'll leave that be. We continue to participate in uh, Champaign County First, which has now picked up and has, is running with that momentum. Uh, Innovation Celebration we held recently, another initiative of the EDC jointly with uh, other members in the community, university, and the cities to really celebrate a lot of the uh, innovation that goes on in the communities. And finally, I'd like to touch on UC2B as uh, a, a major asset. And we've been meeting over the past months with the uh, the policy group and uh, we're going to begin working with them more to develop some marketing materials uh, to help really push this forward as an asset when we talk with the site consultants and we've had some data center interest in this as well and so you know, we really need to um, move ahead with some force on this because uh, this is a very unique asset for us um, when it comes to uh, national exposure and competitiveness. Oh, I, I, another thing I'd like to touch on is our interaction with uh, our Urbana staff. And we, uh, we, we uh, communicate regularly. They have been helping us update available properties on the Location 1 Information Systems database. And so a lot of the uh, available properties that are out there, available buildings, um, are now online and they're uh, viewable by site consultants. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to Greg to address a little about the SBDC. Good evening. Small Business Development Center. Our, we're sponsored by the Small Business Administration uh, out of Washington. We're sponsored by the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity out of Springfield and the EDC here locally. Our job is to help our small businesses grow, uh, to offer our expertise to help them in whatever they need. We'll counsel businesses on financial matters, cash flow. Uh, we'll counsel them on marketing. Uh, equity matters, uh, HR matters. So we try and bring together skill set to help our small businesses succeed and grow. Just a, a note for you before I go into some statistics. I've been working very closely with Brandon Boys here on your staff and with Tom. And we've uh, developed a program whereby your downtown grants, uh, people come to us for counseling. We make sure they have a reasonable business plan uh, and it can be successful. It's been very, very successful. I think we've counseled five or six so far that have qualified for your grants uh, seems to be a real blossoming of effort in downtown Urbana and we're very very proud to be a part of that and help those businesses we've developed some great relationships with those people and I think it's going to be very successful in the long run uh, just so you know over this this fiscal year or this calendar year uh, we've counseled 59 different clients that includes 21 minority clients 12 female owned businesses uh, and that included 397 hours of counseling uh, we're on a track to beat last year. Last year we were at 1,371 hours total, and we had 131 clients. So this year we're, uh, uh, our efforts are growing, and uh, we're very excited to uh, be a part of downtown Urbana and part of the community and our county and help our businesses grow. 
I would be remiss if I didn't mention as that as CEO of the Economic Development Corporation how much I appreciate Council Member Marlin's contribution to the EDC as well. Uh, one of the things that I find most refreshing about Council Member Marlin is that she challenges me to think in new ways. And uh, she has lots of, lots of good ideas, uh, lots of good suggestions, and that's very helpful to us as we move forward and, uh, and transform the organization to be the most effective organization it can be on behalf of all the communities in the county. Um, with that, let me open the floor for questions from you all, anything that we might be able to address for you this evening we haven't talked about. Eric Jacobson. Uh, we had uh, long discussions, of course, on council about UC2B and, and how the build-out might go. And maybe I'm missing something, but I don't see that much build-out has occurred a little bit we've we have uh, we had one application for putting new fiber and right-of-way but is there something is, or is it moving in a way that you had hoped is there anything that we can do to move it uh, faster than it's apparently moving or or what 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 is appropriate things to say about that to us and and to the public. Well, let me say this, and I, um, I'm certain that Council Member Bowersox Johnson may want to may want to add to that to this answer. Um, from my perspective, we have a, a significant advantage in the rings that have already been built out. Uh, the challenge that we have before us now is building what I call the last mile. The, the distance in between the rings and, and those that wish to use the service. And partially, I think that that's a, a, a and again, council member, you may wish to, to weigh in on this. My perspective is that that, that is coming. Uh, it's a, and I don't, it's not my intention to speak for the policy board, but um, my sense of it is, is that they're in the process of selecting who those contractors will be. And that, that at that point, I think we'll see a greater acceleration of deployment. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's fair. I think from the economic, with just looking at the economic development hat, the thing that matters the most is that at any business parcel, you know, any property or even any residence, so you can, you know, recruit good employees, you'd be able to say that y the place you want to locate your business or the place your staff can live will have the world's fastest internet and redundant connections and fiber and all of those benefits. And so right now, looking at an average parcel, well, it's nice there are these rings and there's some infrastructure, but there isn't actually service you can't just call up a provider at any given place in the county and say okay hook me up here so i think it's this e expansion effort that will make the difference for you all in being able to sell this as an economic development tool when people are considering locating here um, and so i think from their perspective whatever we do to build it out is fine i think from our perspective we have to make sure that the t's and the i's are crossed and dotted and that we figure out all the details about an expansion that's sustainable for the long term that that has the right governance structure that has the right ownership structure and the right public benefits but from their perspective however it gets done if it can get done in a comprehensive way across the territory and if it can get done soon while there, there still is a time advantage where where we're way ahead of so many other places in the country that's what matters for ed yeah i think that there are two key aspects to uc to be um, the first one is uh, as a council member pointed out is the speed of the service uh, you know so the degree to which you're, you're able to differentially impact the amount of data flow through the system and so certainly the infrastructure lends itself to that the other is the fact that it's an open network and so if for instance you could have fiber built to your facility today if you were willing to pay for it and recognize that you might have only that one provider that built that that data pipeline to your to your office and you'd be stuck with whoever that was because they built that. But with UC to B, I think you have the ability to choose among providers of that data. And that provides for a cost leveraging opportunity that you don't have under the current structure of just having a single provider build out uh, a data pipeline to your, to your facility. Is that accurate? Yeah. So to me, that's the real differentiator of UC to B. 
The speed is important, absolutely. That's a differentiator. But a huge differentiator from a business perspective, a business cost perspective, is, a is the ability to cost leverage those providers against one another and make the best financial deal you can for the data service. And that, I to me, is the, is the real market difference that we have that we're able to offer a company that other places in the country, the vast majority of our competition, is unable to offer. Charlie? Well, I was going to add to the UCTB discussion a little bit, and maybe Brandon can answer this. Uh, we do have some sections of the city that are wired, both mm -hmm. cities, uh, uh, where services are being provided and businesses could be serviced. So, I mean, there are some, there are 11 census tract areas where businesses can be hooked up. And, and so the question for Brandon is, new businesses coming in, uh, what's the provision? Can they currently get service added on uh, if they weren't part of this first pass in the in the in the areas where they where the last mile has been built right right now this summer's hookups are just people that were grant eligible and part of the first pass and there will still be more so there might be some businesses among the list of the hundreds and hundreds of places that will be plugged in this summer some of those may be business parcels in the 11 census tracts but after this summer's construction phase is over if a business calls you up next year and says, I want to connect, the, there's not currently a plan for that. That'll depend partly on the expansion partner. Um, so you have nearly all the infrastructure except the wire from the curb into your building. And it could be that UC2B continues doing that in the 11 census tracts. It could be that the other private partner does that even in the 11 census tracts. And I, and I should add that we have staff uh, things that are going on at the staff level evaluating proposals and and that's moving along I'd say we're probably six months out from negotiating with a particular person or a partner or a partner or a company I should say and uh, my my expectation is you know we're two to five years out depending on where you are in the community and how the build out occurs to get that last mile built mm -hmm. Eric this this may be a naive idea but I, I would note that we're just, we're, we're spending other people's dollars to build, to extend Lincoln Avenue to Olympian Drive in the hope that, you know, and expectation actually, that that's going to be developed commercially. It would be such a small increment on the pavement costs to, to lay fiber out from the ring mm up Lincoln Avenue is is there is there any possibility that the people who are giving us the money for the pavement might might be persuaded to just add a lot of value for a little increment by uh, underwriting the laying of fiber from the ring out there it's a good idea I think if I understood Bill Gray's kind of shaking his head was that that would not be eligible under the same dollars that are funding Lincoln Avenue now but it might be a consideration worth having of us figuring out at the local level if it's worth extending UC to be up past or closer to some of those parcels. Mm -hmm. Right now it goes north of I-74 because there's a medical facility there, but it does not go even further up Lincoln yet. I, I, I'm actually not thinking of, of those dollars, uh, you know, the dollars that we're getting being eligible for that purpose. What I'm thinking is that the people who gave us those dollars wanted, you know, wanted us to wanted there to be economic development might they give us a few more dollars to to make that really happen okay anyone else thank you very much oh, sorry I, I, oh, I Charlie one more has another question. okay so so the the uh, uh, small business development stuff is is uh, particular interest you know since since it's uh, you, since you're making inroads here, uh, you didn't break it down by Urbana versus Champagne. I guess that's probably not all that important to get these businesses going. Um, if people want to find out more about your classes and so on, I get your mailing list, so I, I see the announcements of the classes coming. Uh, is everything posted on your on the EDC website, or is there a separate website, or how does how does that how are you how are you publicizing and will be publicizing this in the future? 
gave the microphone to Greg. <laughs> um, the, yes, as a matter of fact, we're making a point to, to market that, not just through uh, e electronic means, emails and things of that nature, but also out on the web page as well. And what I've asked our communications director, Carly McCrory, to do is to put together a schedule of classes so that you'll get a sense of what's coming down the pike. Um, both of these guys are working on uh, business workshops. I've, I've asked Greg to work on expanding our offerings from a small business perspective, and I've asked Eric to work on, as we talk with businesses in business retention and expansion visits and issues arise, we're putting together workshops on a basis of those primary, uh, those issues that seem most everyone is dealing with, so that we can help them ex explore and address those issues collectively. And what, what kind of costs are there to the to attending your classes. Well, and let's, uh, I'd just like to make clar one clarification. Uh, classes is, is not probably a misnomer. Uh, where, where our target market is, is there are uh, great facilities and offerings already in our community. Parkland College is a wonderful asset to our community and they have all kinds of business training in their business training center and in, the, in their college. And we don't want to duplicate that. There's also a, our sister organization sponsored by SBA and part of the chamber is the, the uh, SCORE. And they offer uh, classes on beginning your business and financing a small business and we don't want to duplicate those. We're sitting in the middle uh, taking clients who have gone through their basic training at SCORE and helping them individually. But we're also on the seminar side, we're bringing uh, topics to our clients in a two to three hour seminar type idea where they can get basic information, get outlines of the topics, and find out where more information is available. We've had them, for example, on QuickBooks, an introduction to QuickBooks. We don't want to train people on how to do it. We just give them an introduction, what's available, if it's right for them, and then if they want to take a course, there's a course at Parkland about that. We're working on courses on marketing, financing, uh, human resources, those kinds of things. And again, our object is to give information to our business community about basics of those topics and then let them know where the additional information is and help them find that information for their businesses and their employees. Dennis. Yeah. This is sort of uh, spinning off of Eric uh, Jacobson's comment. Um, I've, I've noticed, and I was uh, driving actually uh, not too long ago with John Dimmitt up to Chicago, and he was pointing out the, um, the large developments that are occurring just outside of Rantoul mm -hmm. that um, your group has uh, put a lot of attention in assisting very successfully. And uh, so it made me wonder if, um, uh, if the uh, Economic Development Corporation uh, also felt that uh, the development of um, um, properties that are uh, to the north of Urbana that are being connected now through the uh, Olympian Drive extension and the Lincoln Avenue North um, offer a lot of promise for our future growth. Uh, it's hard to tell, I imagine, uh, to speculate, but um, it seems like that was like one of the issues that came up, whether we should go in that direction or not, build this infrastructure or not. And um, I'd like to hear your comments about what you think um, the result is, could be for the community. Councilman, I think you're referring to the Easton Bell project in Rantoul. Uh, yeah, that, a fantastic project, and we were pleased, thrilled actually, to be a part of that project. Um, one of the things that, that Eric talked about, I think, was Olympian Drive. Actually, it's in Olympian Drive is in my remarks tomorrow for the Busey Seminar. So if you're coming to the Busey Seminar, I'm going to be speaking about that briefly. Um, Olympian Drive is particularly exciting to me for a couple of reasons. First, from an existing business standpoint, there are a number of businesses up north that in order to get their trucks to the highway have to go through the city, it creates congestion, they deal with stoplights, so there's increased fuel usage, which I don't consider to be a particularly green use of transportation if they're idling at stoplights, number one. There's a traffic issue in terms of those trucks being mixed in with the rest of the traffic, and from a business perspective, there's an added cost if they have to drive a further distance in order to get to the ultimate destination. So the construction of Olympian Drive will assist us with that. Um, the ultimate completion of Olympian Drive, uh, including the flyover over the CN tracks and built out not just to, to Lincoln but ultimately US 45, is going to, I think, dramatically enhance the opportunities for additional business expansion in the area up around Olympian Drive. Uh, that without that infrastructure would be more challenging to accomplish because of the reasons I just mentioned, having to run truck traffic through the city and stoplights and so on. So I view it as a very positive development. From my perspective, it can't be built fast enough. Uh, I'm anxious to see that completed. 
Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you, members of the council. Next is um, unfinished business. We have ordinance number 2013-03-025, an ordinance amending Schedule J of Section 23-183 of the Urbana Local Traffic Code prohibiting parking at all times on certain streets, which would be Kinch Street. I move adoption of the ordinance. Okay, motion by Eric Jacobson, seconded by Charlie Smythe. Any discussion? Heather. Um, I'll be voting no. I've heard from several constituents um, in the area, and um, mm -hmm. honestly, it's, uh, I, I know we were showing some pictures where there's not a lot of parking, and there's people who, you know, don't have their cars parked in, the, in their driveways. Um, but there also aren't a lot of bikes, and I know that um, uh, the gentleman said that there was a car at one or a bike at 120 in the morning. I drive that area multiple times a day and um, don't see a lot of bikes, and I do actually see cars. I, I do see more cars parked than the one that um, was shown in the slides. Um, I have a daughter who lives on East Pennsylvania and from my house going down Kinch is one of the best ways to get there um, and uh, so based on my observations and based on the letters that I've received from multiple constituents um, I'll be voting no on this anyone else Dennis yeah um, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to hear from the neighborhood and from the community at large about this issue and I know that uh, it was uh, an issue that did cause a lot of concern in the community. Uh, it's been in the traffic commission for about three and a half months before it came to us, and we've heard um, a significant amount of input from it. Because of the, um, my observed, um, my observation is that there are there is a lot of adequate uh, driveway parking on the street, and uh, from various times that I've been driving up and down. Kinch, I have not seen an overwhelming amount of uh, car parking on the street, like three or four at most. Uh, and because there's been a concern about uh, the speed of traffic on that street and the belief that having bike lanes in will um, help slow traffic by narrowing the visible uh, marked lane for for um, eastbound and, or north and southbound traffic, um, my I'm going to be voting for this uh, a limitation of traffic, and uh, it's not an easy con. It's not has been not been an easy conversation, but I think the greatest good we served by connecting the two um, the street, which connects two different elementary schools and allows bike tra traffic to go north and south on it for students and adults alike. So I'll support it. Okay, Eric. Uh, I don't want to take. A lot of time replicating arguments or repeating arguments that we've already heard but I just want to briefly state why I will vote in favor of this number one it seems as though even if the parking on the street is cut by the indicated amount that it will still be more than enough uh, capacity for for the usage number two I do believe that adding striped bike lanes is uh, will make the say the street safer uh, all of the evidence uh, that I know of or can find uh, uh, suggests that that will make the street safer. Also, my own experience in uh, biking on campus before and after uh, uh, lanes were striped on uh, Goodwin Avenue, both what I experienced and what I've seen. Uh, one new thing, uh, one new piece of information since the time that I uh, since last week's meeting is I did some research online and all the evidence that I can find is that striped bike lanes dedicated bike lanes in residential areas make real estate values go up I could not find a single uh, a, a, any evidence of the reverse uh, and, and then finally the process is if against all you know 
uh, all of all all evidence, it proved out to be it proved to be unsuccessful. It can be reversed. It's just stripes painted on the street. So uh, so so I will be voting yes for all of these reasons. Charlie. Uh, Ted, would, to uh, and clarify something Eric has said here, um, this isn't a true traffic calming as we've done it before. We're not removing lanes, so it's it's not a uh, it's not a road diet per se, but it is putting some infrastructure, some lines lines down the middle of the street that aren't there already. They may or may not have an impact. I think we're ultimately we're going to have to take some additional uh, safety measures here, including. You know, hopefully getting some street lights at, at least at intersections all along here and uh, and providing uh, some stop signs that's uh, evaluation work that we can uh, get done uh, hopefully uh, over the summer but a part of it will need to be done evaluating after lines are put in place as well so did you want to say something I just had a question okay. um, what is I can't Remember, what are the numbers for the cost of the striping? I do not have the file with me this evening, so I there is a breakdown of each street segment. I could email that information to council tomorrow if, if you wish. But I don't have the cost of the striping. I want to say it's probably no more than ten, fifteen thousand, but I, I don't know for sure. Thanks, Bill. It's in the grants, yes. Okay. Anyone else? Would oh Brandon. Sorry, one last one. Yeah, I think all this is valid and I also think that well. I, th I look at this corridor holistically. I think the stop signs will be important, so I look forward to conversation about that. I also think perhaps some step enforcement when the new segment is open and perhaps when the stop signs are in. If speeding has been a problem statistically, I know to ask for a police step enforcement detail there at some point when the new street opens um, with the new configuration might be helpful in setting a whole new tone for, for slower, safer driving there. Um, and I hope that the streetlight conversation, even though I know that's a longer term plan, can can uh, can be considered as we weigh all the capital budget priorities for the future. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bauer Sox Johnson. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Lewis. No. Miss Marlin. No. Mr. Roberts. Yes. Mr. Smythe. Yes. Miss Stevenson. No. I believe that motion carries. Thank you. Reports of standing committees. The first item that we're going to do is item H, ordinance number 2013-04-030, an ordinance amending the Urbana City Code, chapter three, section 3-43, increasing the number of class AA liquor licenses for Eastland Suites Urbana, LLC. So moved. Second. Motion by Stevenson, seconded by Lewis. Brandon? This is the one that I'll, uh, again, abstain from just in order to avoid any appearance of a conflict of interest. Uh, ditto. Okay, we have um, two council members abstaining. Um, I guess I wasn't supposed yeah, I to do yeah. that one. Sorry about that. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate your uh, taking that. <laughs> well, I already did. Sorry, it, so yeah, it was under the it. new business, <laughs> not under new business. Okay, um, do we have, do we have a motion? I moved it. Yeah, motion by Stevenson, second by Lewis. Okay, um, would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Jacobson. Uh, yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Miss Marlin. Yes. Mr. Roberts. Yes. Miss Stevenson. Yes. That motion carries. Okay, we will move to petitions and communications. Jeff Yaki, do I have your name correctly? Mm -hmm. Yaki, yeah. Okay. So is Jeff Yaki is here? Well, um, Michael Kilcullen. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. You Hello. have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Michael Kilcullen, 202 North Ray Street, Urbana, Illinois. And I am speaking about the Kent Street issue again. And uh, I wanted to uh, mainly, I, I did go out and do some individual survey voluntarily on my own without being hired by either the city or by the residents. And I wanted to take a little bit of time just to make some notes about some of my uh, observations and comments. I was out there yesterday during the evening around 6 p.m., which was still daylight, as you can see in this first picture. And there's some cars parked, uh, or a, a car parked. There's some cars driving um, right away here at Kinshaw, Washington, so on the north side of the area. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of going through these fast because there are a lot. And all these pictures are available. I will they, they will be submitted to the city for good. So, uh, But uh, we see just only about two or three vehicles are parked in the entire stretch during the day. Um, there are some people walking on the sidewalk as well, so some people are out. We do see the area where the road is wide and it's narrowing down to that southern half, or southern, very southern portion. And the thing I will notice, okay, we have, there's a small issue here of the driveway that's maybe incomplete. Most of the driveways have been filled in a bit. Um, more. So what I'm really seeing during the day is that almost most houses uh, have driveway, uh, every house had driveways and garages. Most of them were double spaced, double cars. There's a few, this is a duplex, and it had a single lane drive and a single garage on each side. S but uh, here's some of the side streets. And so just looking at that, th this is neither yay or nay, but this is just information. And we see this on a Sunday. Most of the traffic reports or studies that probably were done by the city or public works might have been during weekdays. We were told that people are at work during the day. So I came out on a Sunday when we expect people to be home or about or having dinners with families. So this is just a sampling. Um, I believe this is the corner where we have trouble while, where people are vereening around into mailboxes, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a separate issue uh, about uh, the stop sign study, perhaps. Okay. Now, I did go back out there later. Oh, I will say there were two people on bicycles during the day. They were both adult men, and they were both on a sidewalk, actually. Uh, other people were walking around. There were kids playing in some front yards on one of the side streets. It's, you know, so people were out during the day. Yeah. Now, I went back out at 1 a.m. during the night last night and this morning. It is dark out there. It is very dark out there. Um, s a few of these pictures are taken with flash. Some of them are not, and I don't have a good night camera. This is actually at the corner of Washington and Vine where we see a Sharrow's bike marking, and this is the Washington Street where the bike lane starts where you guys had already previously prohibited the parking. Um, so on the way, you know, on the way down to Washington and Kinch here. So this is a K on Kinch. That same car that was parked during the day is still here. This is the only car on the entire stretch that's still that was parked overnight. And this is in the white section because the church is on the left side and the house is on the right. At um, so this is now looking down the street without the flash. With flash, so you can see just how dark it really is down there. Um, trying to get signs, and even that was hard. <laughs> um, what I saw, at even at 1.22 a.m. northbound, a guy was riding a bicycle. I was so shocked. <laughs> there were, when I was on my way southbound, there was two, a guy and a lady talking on one of the side streets. That it was qu a normal conversation, not yelling, no, you know, no fight. I could never did see them. It was so dark, so I don't know if they were on a sidewalk or on a porch or on property. But people were just casually talking outside. It didn't, s you know. Um, you have so one minute, Mr. Kilcullen. Thank you. Okay, so I saw the bicycle coming northbound. I got to the inner street, and then I was uh, when I was riding back northbound on Kinch. Then a guy was walking down the sidewalk about 1:30 a.m. with a styro full of food, and he was eating his food walking down the sidewalk. And then three other people were on a side street at that, you know, a little bit later. And then I got back up to the end. So. Um, I'm just saying to take some of this at its worth, uh, you will see as we get down. Every, this is the southern half, and you will see like every 
gr uh, every driveway, I, I took a picture of each house on the southern end, and every driveway had empty spots uh, where extra cars could either park inside, or uh, on the drive, I mean. Don't know inside or outside the garage, but there was no cars on the street, and there was no cars even in driveways. So these are just pictures. You can make your own opinions. I'm not going to state much about that. Okay. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Yaki. Hello, Jeff Yaki. I'm at 304 West Washington Street. I'm also the uh, president of the Champaign County Bikes, an education and advocacy group. And a number of our members um, were always interested in these things uh, around the town. And a uh, number of our folks uh, took a look at it. And I think you heard from a couple of them last week. Um, I just submitted a letter. I'll just quickly uh, read it, I guess, into the record here. Um, Thanks for carefully looking at this opportunity to add bike infrastructure on Kinch Street as part of the Safe Routes to School project, and thanks for being mindful of the concerns of the residents on Kinch Street. I support the bike infrastructure as, as planned. Retrofitting existing streets to bike infra infrastructure does bring some changes to current residents. After reviewing the plans and listening to the discussions concerning these improvements on Kinch, I understand the changes to be reasonable and on the whole very minimal. One change we can't see today or tomorrow, but we can expect to see in the future, is more and more kids and neighborhood residents riding to school and other destinations on Kinch Street. This is change for the good, for personal health and economics and the environment. I think that's something to keep in mind. As we're working in our community to add more bike lanes, we're connecting sections that are, are well equipped with sections that, you know, with future improvements, and all that connectivity makes it easier for more and more people to think about going where they need to go, from where they live, to school, to work, to errands, that kind <coughs> of stuff. And so uh, we are approaching some critical mass, and I think that's a very good thing. And this is uh, a, a part of that Safe Routes to School plan, which connects residents to the primary schools and also the older kids down to the middle school and uh, high school. And so. Um, you won't see that overnight, but as we do more and more of these improvements, we will see more bikes on streets. Um, just one other thought here. Uh, along with the discussion of this bike plan, I heard concerns about neighborhood safety, particularly the speed of traffic on Kinch and the absence of streetlights. These are real concerns, and I encourage the council to look for means to address both of these issues. Slower traffic and a well-lit street creates a very favorable environment for pedestrians and bicyclists, as well as the neighborhood as a whole even for the neighbor out in his or her yard late in the evening with their dog. Be glad for any questions. Thanks for letting me uh, address this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, we have <coughs> two people who want to just register that they're here. Uh, Reverend Dr. Evelyn B. Underwood um, is here for concerns over the sewer resolution and Bishop King James Underwood um, is here representing the Dr. Ellis subdivision, and he too is has concern for the resolution of the sewer problem. Okay, Christina Beatty. Christina Beatty, 1304 Kinch. Uh, northeast corner of Kinchin, Michigan. Uh, spoke a couple weeks ago, uh, learned a lot at that meeting, and just wanted to briefly follow up. Uh, now that the weather's nicer, I've been taking a lot more walks with my son and thinking about this a lot, and I'm definitely growing uh, in favor of it. I appreciate all the work the city council has done. I think there's a lot of research. I read the memo from, was it Gabe Lewis on April 4th, and that really spelled out and answered a lot of questions. Um, and so I also want to say that the communication from you has been good as well. At one point it was mentioned that maybe the neighborhood didn't know about it, but I remember getting all, I want to say, three letters, at least two. Um, so I just want to clarify that. Uh, and then even just the thought of that bike, bike lanes might even slow traffic down a little bit, that would be helpful. So just want to reemphasize the street lights and the possible stop sign. And other than that, thank you. Thank you. Rick Langwa. I don't need to see you guys. Okay. Uh, he is in favor of the city plan. Okay, thank you all. So uh, I should go back to the... Uh, resolution A. Resolution A. 
Resolution number 2013-04-014R, resolution for the improvement by municipality under the Illinois Highway Code. This concerns Race Street. For the uh, Committee of the Whole, I, approve, I move approval. Second. Is there any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. That motion carries. Okay. The next item is concerns uh, King Park uh, public art projects. First, resolution number 2013-04-015R, a resolution authorizing and approving a mutual release with uh, Awaka LCC uh, for the committee. I move approval. Second. Okay, motion by Dennis Roberts, second by Robert Lewis. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. That motion carries. Okay, the next item under the King Park Public Art Project. Resolution number 2013-04-016R, a resolution authorizing and approving a new agreement with Preston Jackson for public art design services for the King Park Public Art Project. For the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Robert Lewis. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. That motion carries. And then finally, under King Park Public Art Project, ordinance number 2013-04-028, an ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance, King Park Public Arts Project. Uh, for the committee, I move approval. Second. Okay, motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Charlie. Charlie Smythe. Charlie Smythe wins the coin toss. <laughs> okay, um, any other discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes. That motion carries. Next comes resolution number 2013-04-017R, a resolution approving the City of Urbana and Ur Urbana Home Consortium Annual Action Plan for fiscal year 2013-14. to 14. Uh, For the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Charlie Smythe. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. That motion carries. Next is an ordinance number 2013-04-029, an ordinance approving modifications to the City of Urbana and Urbana Home Consortium for the year 2011 to 2012 annual action plan, and this has to do with a down payment program. For the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Robert Lewis. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Okay. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. That motion carries. Okay, next comes uh, Item F on the agenda, resolution number 2013-04-018R, a resolution amending housing rehabilitation program operational guidelines as originally authorized by resolution number 2010-04-010R. For <coughs> the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Eric Jacobson. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? 
Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. That motion carries. Okay, the last <coughs> item from the Committee of the Whole is the resolution number 2013-04-019R, a resolution evidencing the intention of the City of Urbana, Champaign County, Illinois, to transfer volume cap in connection with private activity bond issues, multiple multifamily revenue bonds and related matters, private bond cap allocation uh, EIEDA series 2013. And for the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Robert Lewis. Any discussion? <coughs> Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. And that, that, concludes, motion carries. that concludes our business from the Committee of the Whole. Thank you very much. D um, Brandon? I had a quick question about upcoming Committee of the Whole agendas. I know we've had a number of people in our audience coming about the sewer issue, which was not on tonight's agenda, but people registered their presence. Is that something that we can advise the public that's scheduled for an upcoming committee meeting? I think it's going to come um, next meeting. Okay. 20th. That might be Monday the 22nd. Whatever next Monday is. Okay. Great. I see staff nodding too. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Reports of officers. Tom Carino, Economic Development. Yes, hi. I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention that you should have a poster in front of you, a little teaser for the upcoming market season. Uh, what I wanted to mention is that if anyone would like more copies of this, we can get those to you. Uh, just contact me or contact uh, Natalie Kenny Marquez, and we can get you more of these posters if you'd like. So looking forward to the upcoming season. Okay. Thank you very much. Up at the church. Um, any other reports of officers? There's yes. One, one more. Yes, I just wanted to let you know that um, before you, I, I placed a CD with all of the applications that we received for consolidated social service funding. Um, there's also two spreadsheets. Um, one, the smaller one, has all of the agencies that applied for funding, and it shows their three previous years of funding. And the larger one is the working worksheet that shows all the agencies and what they have requested for this fiscal year. So, um, and then I also, I, I believe that there is a study session next week on um, April 22nd. So if you could review the applications and let us know um, at that meeting if you would like to have any presentations from any of the agencies we can certainly schedule that and could maybe have it on the April 29th when the, since that's the fifth Monday um, so um, so yes if you could look and see because there may be some new app agencies that you may be unfamiliar with or you just may have some questions and so if you could just let us know next week that would be great Heather. I just want to reiterate the new the incoming council members have been invited correct as far as I know okay. I'm, I haven't I'm not involved in the scheduling of that but as okay. far as I know yes. okay because this isn't due till some of us won't be on yeah, the council we anymore. have been inviting them <laughs> okay I see one of them in the audience I just want <laughs> you know them to yeah. Be aware of. Oh, yeah. We tried to get them okay. up to speed okay. on all the budget things and everything. They're okay. invited to come to the Great. meetings. They don't get to vote until they get sworn in. But right. But they will. We want them this. to be <laughs> informed. Right. Charlie. And and Kelly, if we could get those electronically, I'd appreciate it. Okay. I will make sure that we send those out. Yeah. And you know, speaking of new council members, uh, it'd be good to schedule a an orientation for them between now and. May 5th, Six. That yeah. the last day, we, yeah. Well, I don't know if we're going to do it before, but um, I, they will get. I think it'd be easier. There'll be sev several sessions, be I think. Good if they could land on their feet at, on day one. OK, Eric. Yeah, I have a, I have a, a question for legal. So I, I'm, you know, in my other life, I, I serve on um, 
uh, yeah, so. review panels for grant proposals, uh, you know, for federal science agencies. And, and there, the panel, you know, gets together and discusses the merits of proposals. Is there any, now it, this seems to be, I guess we've had, we've so far uh, felt that this was, pre, it was be precluded for us to, in closed session, discuss the merits of these proposals with each other. Um, is there any, you know, I actually feel, I mean, I've been part of both processes now. And I feel that discussions like that result in, in, and without, you know, criticizing decisions that we've made, I just feel as a general, as general proposition that discussions like that result in better decisions. And I'm just wondering, is there any path, any legal path towards us being able to do that? When you say being able to do that, you mean have discussions regarding funding in public or in No, private? having a discussion regarding funding in a closed session. Because, um, because that would be the counterpart to what, you know, to what we do in, in, for example, federal science agencies when we're reviewing proposals. Or indeed, that would be the counterpart to how proposals are dealt with that we submit to funding agencies at higher levels of government. Given that this is uh, basically city grant funding in terms of Open Meetings Act, you know, I'd have to look at that specific issue. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, certain kinds of deliberations uh, don't have to be, you know, there's exceptions. And I'm not sure that there's an exception for deliberating over what grants to give. Um, the better part of valor would be to have two council members uh, meet with, you know, the professionals on our staff that are developing the program and then coming to the council and making recommendations. Uh, and, and, and if the council chooses to debate them in public, they can. But uh, my gut reaction without having done the research relating to grants is it would probably still be governed by the open meetings, but I can take a look at that tomorrow and shoot everyone an email. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Any other um, reports or anything? I would like to um, note that we are having a distinguished artist from China, and his landscape work is already up in the Artist of the Corridor. His name is Lu Junggang, and we are having a formal opening of the exhibition on Saturday at 4.30. There'll be a little reception here, and then we'll have a dinner in his honor at 6 o'clock on Saturday the 20th at Silver Creek Restaurant. Anything else? Uh, reports of officers? Okay, um, we'll move on to new business. Um, mayoral appointments. I have three Zoning Board of Appeals, Ashley McLaughlin, Community Development Commission, Elizabeth Se Searing, and Market Advisory Board, Diane Marlin. So moved. Okay. Um, motion by Heather Stevenson, seconded by Charlie Smythe. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, ordinance number 2013-04-031, an ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance. This is for state motor fuel tax, Race Street from Washington Street to Michigan Avenue. That is right in front of Urbana High School. Yeah. Brandon. I will move approval. Second. Okay, motion by Brandon Bowersox Johnson, um, seconded by Robert Lewis, is that correct? Any discussion? No one's going to say it's about time? Okay. Can't okay. Can't wait. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes.
that motion carries. And next we have a closed session. If someone would like to make the motion. Charlie Smith had his hand. The only one who knows how to do this is Charlie Smith. Oh, I'm not okay, this. Charlie. Uh, I move that we go into a closed session for the purposes of property acquisition issues pursuant to five Illinois Consolidated Statutes, uh, 120 over 2, C5. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion by Charlie Smythe, seconded by Eric Jacobson. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes. So, Diane, are you going to be in closed session upstairs? Are you going to take me up there with you? Well, I think we could probably do it technologically, but I just want to know if you've run out of um, stamina at this point. You want to you tune in on it? I'll try to tune in. Okay. We'll, we'll talk to you upstairs then. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to go into open session? I make that motion. Second. Okay. Um, motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Robert Lewis. Madam Clerk, does this require a roll call to go back into open session? I do not want one. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, we're in open session. We are at uh, ordinance number 2013-04-032, and ordinar ordinance authorizing the purchase of certain real estate, 908 East Oregon Street. I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, seconded by Brandon Bowersox Johnson. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes. That motion carries. Next, ordinance number 2013-04-033, an ordinance authorizing the purchase of certain real estate, 810 Park Street. I move approval. Second. Motion by Dennis Roberts, second by Robert Lewis. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Bowersox Johnson? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes. That motion carries. There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.